All right. Good afternoon. Today is October 28th, Friday. My name is Kamal Arkan. This is UMAT TV. Uh, I'm going to have a couple of our people who are going to join me in the next couple of minutes. We have a special guest today. Uh, but first, I'm going to actually have Sean to join me and then get our COVID updates. And Sean, well, Sean actually is right in here in my room. So I'm not going to fake it. So we are right here. We can see each other. How are you doing, Sean? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. So um, I see, uh, other than our agenda, I see there's a different slide. Uh, tell us about that a yep. little bit. Um, so you'll see the agenda and accompanied with that, we have our slide uh, just pointing out that our UMACO um, has been responsible for over 400,000 appointments. That is across specialists and PCP offices uh, for all our Delawareans here. And that is just in the first nine months year to date. So, so this is important because uh, we provide services for more than 100,000 Delawareans uh, in almost 400,000 appointments, there are yeah. 400,000 encounters either in person, video, uh, in any other forms, this number is big. And that's why actually we are doing this session mm -hmm. is because uh, this is important for uh, our uh, people in Delaware. So this is actually how the COVID update started. So let's go with that as well. Yep, so our COVID updates, everything is looking pretty much the same as last week number wise regarding the vaccinations and is also uh, in terms of the case count. Two things I did want to point out really quickly here is just the announcement uh, a couple of days ago, we saw that the COVID-19 test kits uh, from, the from the government are not free anymore. So uh, there is a, a link in there uh, pointing out the best COVID-19 test kits that you can buy online for your at-home testing. And then also just point out uh, some of the symptoms that they're watching with the new variants. There's a couple that are slightly different, but uh, they seem to be still status quo with those that also mimic the flu. So. We did touch on the past couple of weeks how people should get their flu shots as well, mm -hmm. flu season coming in. Um, so I just wanted to remind everyone the symptoms are the same, but you want to be rather uh, safe than sorry. So those well, test kits. Flu season is going to be the key. And I want to make sure that people, um, and we are going to repeat this again and again, mm -hmm. please prepare for winter. So don't wait until you get sick. The flu, se flu season this year is going to be more severe than any other year because of the the last two years of COVID or the well, last three years of COVID. So it's going to be 2023. Mm -hmm. um, but hopefully uh, people would take advantage of what we are telling them and then they would benefit from the conversation we are having with uh, regarding these issues. Right. All right. Well, uh, Sean, thank you so much. So I'll bring you back again later on. But in the meantime, uh, we'll put you back in the waiting room because I have two... Uh, beautiful ladies who are going to join me. So let's see. All right. So I see uh, Sarah McBride and uh, Brown. Hopefully, you can hear me okay. Um, so I'm going to. Move this a little bit here. Let's do it this way. Okay, good. So, well, uh, I was just telling Sean that I'm going to put him in the waiting room it's because I have two wonderful ladies waiting for me. So, how are you guys doing? I, I don't know who's going to talk first. I'm doing well. Thank you. Well, this is actually the first time we are doing something like this uh, where we have two guests uh, together, uh, especially with the state officials. So, we try to kind of keep it with one. Uh, but then because we are getting really close to the election, we want to make sure that we can reach out to as many people as possible. And uh, and Sarah, actually, uh, this is your third time uh, in, in the show. And I really do appreciate your support and willingness to take the time uh, with uh, Representative Melissa Minor Brown. This is our first time we ever met. Um, in fact, we were just saying that five minutes ago when you just logged into Zoom, that's when we met. So, um, and you know, we make a lot of good friends. Uh, last week, I have Lydia York, never met her, talked to her once on the phone. Uh, and it was a great conversation. It felt like if you knew each other for a long time. And uh, usually that's the feeling that we get uh, from these sessions. And I do wanna thank you guys uh, for joining us and uh, helping uh, 
uh, with the message that we want to give out there. Now, um, we we have our format in a way that um, nothing is um, set in stone, so we do change it very frequently. So in this one, we want to do the same. So I do want you guys to uh, perhaps introduce yourself, and then we are going to talk about the current uh, items that uh, perhaps current bills that you are working on. Uh, maybe we can start with Melissa, or Sarah, if you want to start first, whoever well, we wants to go first is fine. So I, I'm Melissa Minor Brown. Of course, I'm a state rep um, for Delaware's 17th district, which is the majority of Newcastle. Um, and I am a nurse by training. I am vice chair of the um, Health and Human Development Committee, chair of the Corrections Committee. All right. And good afternoon. Uh, it's wonderful to join you again. And it's great to be on with my wonderful colleague, Representative Minor Brown. She and I were just actually together in Lewis yesterday at a round table on nursing workforce with Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester. And so uh, it's great to be with her on back to back days. My name is Sarah McBride. I am uh, the state senator for the first state Senate district, which includes parts of Wilmington as well as Brandywine 100. And I serve as the chair of the Senate Health and uh, Senate Health and Social Services Committee. I almost said Human Development Committee, but that's the House name. Uh, and I was elected in 2020, so I'm I'm uh, entering my second term after two years. All right. So um, I know you guys are uh, very active with the um, bills that you are sponsoring, the one or co-sponsoring. Um, if we can just have like a background of what you have worked in recently now uh, with. Um, uh, Senator McBride, uh, we uh, covered the paid family. It was kind of like interesting in a way that uh, it wasn't all, like first time when we talked, it was in process. So it didn't happen yet. So then you came back when it did pass. So we were actually really happy to be part of that process. Uh, but I know you, you have so many other uh, bills that you are working on. And uh, because we never met with Melissa, uh, so we don't know. Um, what she has done, we have some information, of course. So if you if you can just give us a brief background on the latest thing that you have worked on, just final and then the new stuff that you are working on. Sure. So, um, well, you know what? I, I'll tell you really quickly. You know, when I when I ran for office, one of the the major reasons why I ran was because one of my patients had passed away because he could not actually get the medication that his his doctor prescribed. Um, and you probably are aware of step therapy, how. You know, you kind of have to trial all these other meds first before you can actually get the med your doctor prescribed uh, because insurance companies put place barriers on that. So actually, when I ran for office, I um, that was one of the first bills that that I did. So I'm excited to say that um, I championed step therapy as a brand new legislator um, four years ago. But um, this this past session was amazing. We, we've gotten so many bills done, health care bills, criminal justice reform bills. Um, but I think my, my big baby um, literally was the momnibus package. Um, and just to give you a, a few stats, I won't um, talk too long about it, but just from 2011 to 2018, um, Black women actually made up one in every four live births, um, live childbirths, but over half of the, the maternal deaths, the deaths that were related to childbirth were Black women in Delaware. And this is a national crisis that we're seeing. So um, there, this was a package of six bills, all related to improving um, maternal health in our state, addressing maternal mortality. Um, it, it talks about shackling of women who are incarcerated. We we expanded the um, we expanded um, the postpartum Medicaid Medicaid coverage to one year post postpartum versus the the uh, sixty days postpartum. We um, included doulas and midwives into our our prisons because that's where the women are most vulnerable. Uh, what else did we do? We made some changes to our Maternal Mortality Review Commission to ensure that it was a diverse commission. And we're actually looking at the socioeconomic status of, of women and, and, and just some, some other factors as well. Um, what else did we do, Sarah? What else, what else was in that, that momnibus? Well, uh, I think the better training for the um, workforce, right? Yes, implicit bias training. And, and not just any training, not just the, the quick yearly training that you just check the box. This is going to be evidence-based um, implicit and explicit bias training. And we've actually created a committee to actually um, work on how we're going to uh, deliver that training. So that that one was, was a big deal as well. Um, and, and of course, uh, Medicaid reimbursement for, for doula coverage. 
Uh, well, so every woman can have access to a that's, doula. That's the term for midwife, is it? Uh, no. So a doula and a midwife are two different, two different um, titles. A doula is actually, um, it's like a woman's advocate during her pregnancy, during her childbirth. It's the person that helps her carry out her birth plan. She's there to educate her on what to expect. She's there to answer any questions, prepare her for doctor visits, and then work with her in the delivery room and postpartum um, as she becomes a new mom and gets acclimated to that. Um, and then one other thing I just want to mention is House Bill 455, because that was something that we had to work fast on when um, the Supreme Court over, overturned Roe v. Wade. We quickly got a bill drafted that would protect women's rights to reproductive health care in Delaware, also protect our clinicians, and also protect women who visit Delaware from out of state seeking um, reproductive health care. So that, that was a big deal. We got it done. Um, literally, like, hardly any opposition at all. <laughs> we just got the bill through. So I'm excited to say that, that Delaware is a safe haven for women coming from out of state and women have access to abortion services. When I was going through these uh, under, so the, I want to say the name, right? So I was just calling yesterday Monibus, but you know, it's a Monibus, right? Monibus yeah, package. Yeah. So I think uh, this kind of uh, aligns with uh, things that we, start, we, we try to do with the uh, SDOH, uh, uh, social determinant of health. So, because some of those missing pieces are not going to be provided by the healthcare providers. So, I don't know uh, in the beginning if you were able to see, uh, we provided services for um, more than 100,000 Delawareans in the last nine months. Mm -hmm. uh, the, in the amount of total number of 400,000 appointments. So that's the number of interaction that we had with our patients. However, uh, when you look at the work that we do, um, especially the changing, um, uh, the way that population is changing, the expectations changing, uh, everything is happening today, uh, providing traditional healthcare is not fixing the problem. So it, it is requiring uh, multiple uh, different pieces. Um, Social determinant of health is getting more momentum now, but we actually started doing that even before because we understood that without having a social worker in the network, there are some patients we won't be able to have the good communication. Uh, therefore, we can actually really provide the good care. Uh, having um, uh, we, Right now, we have about 15 nurses who are working as a care managers uh, in the central office. Um, and now we feel like there are more needs for like, it, it would be great if we have like more social workers, more advocates for the pro, uh, service that we are providing. So reading all these, I do see a really good um, uh, connection to the healthcare, which is like either number one or number two biggest problem that we have from the budget standpoint, also from the social standpoint. So um, I think you won't really see any oppositions to these issues. Uh, hopefully you, uh, you didn't, uh, that's what you were saying, but uh, it's good that you are able to uh, make these things, uh, put it in a way that it is actually more structured and then everyone can actually understand and benefit from it. Thank you for that. Thank you. Now, uh, Sarah McBride is quiet today. <laughs> I, I, I'm just sitting here admiring um, all the amazing things that my colleague uh, did in, in this last term. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm finishing my first term more hopeful than I was when I started it because I believe that this General Assembly has, at the end of the day, been the most productive General Assembly in, in modern state history. Um, from uh, gun safety to uh, abortion rights, uh, as Representative Minor Brown mentioned, uh, to minimum wage and paid family medical leave, We've made real significant, meaningful progress on a whole host of issues. And if I talked about all of those things that all of my colleagues did, we'd be here all day. So I will focus in on some of the bills um, that I was proud to serve as, as a prime sponsor of. Uh, you did mention paid family and medical leave. I would be remiss if I didn't uh, just once again highlight uh, that I am proud that Delaware has become the 12th state in the nation to pass legislation creating a statewide paid family and medical leave insurance program, which provides partial wage replacement to Delaware workers who are out on leave to welcome a child into their family to uh, get healthcare treatment for a serious uh, health condition or to care for a loved one struggling through a serious illness. Um, is the largest expansion of the social safety net in, in modern state history. 
uh, and I'm thrilled that we were able to get it done with a, a bipartisan uh, supermajority in the Delaware General Assembly. In addition to paid family medical leave, which was um, sort of my baby as, as well, I think it's both the monibus and paid family medical leave are, are, are worthy of being called babies in every sense of the word. Um, but beyond that, you know, one of the uh, one of the most important issues that I think we tackled in healthcare, in addition to the omnibus and paid leave, uh, were a series of bills around um, expanding access to mental health care here in Delaware. Uh, so Representative Longhurst sponsored a, a series of bills. I was the Senate prime sponsor of, of one of those bills that expands mental health counselors in our middle schools. We had done elementary schools the year before, um, requires insurance companies to cover uh, annual mental wellness visits. Uh, within state regulated insurance plans, and then a bill that I was the Senate prime sponsor of uh, legislation that creates statewide mental health curriculum and per educational programs within our K through 12 public schools. Um, within the mental health space too, I wanna specifically mention, we know that um, provider burnout is obviously a huge challenge for our healthcare system right now. Um, it's having a tangible impact on both the, the wellness of our providers and the outcomes for our patients. Um, and several years ago, Delaware had adopted fairly draconian mandatory reporting policies for physicians um, when accessing even routine mental health care. And so we reformed those policies to reflect best practices, to open up pathways to mental health care without putting physicians' license at risk, um, because we know that to care for others, these providers need to be able to get care themselves. And so we were uh, thrilled. I was thrilled to be at, at Christiana Care this summer for the governor to sign Senate Bill 300 into law, which will allow our physicians um, to get uh, mental health care, including routine mental health care, like uh, treatment for depression or anxiety without putting their ability to practice at risk. Um, we uh, have really been focusing both this past General Assembly and moving into the next one on dental care. That is a particular passion of, of, of mine and Representative Minor Brown and I have been working together on this. Um, you know, we too often bifurcate healthcare uh, between medicine and then dental vision and hearing. Um, and I think that bifurcation of care is having uh, a really dangerous consequence for, for patients. And it's time that we prioritize the full range of healthcare that people need to live and to thrive. And dental care really is, in addition to primary care, the only area of care where everyone should be getting care routinely throughout their lives. Um, and right now, Delaware struggles uh, when it comes to access for care. Some, some surveys find that Delaware is either 46th or 50th in the nation when it comes to um, uh, dentists per capita. Uh, and that has significant impacts in terms of access. So uh, residents, particularly in Sussex and Kent, uh, are, are facing a real provider shortage, a dentist shortage. And so, so we- That's interesting you mentioned that, uh, yeah. that because I think it was two weeks ago, um, we have our diabetes program, uh, accredited di diabetes program, uh, and we don't have a dentist in our medical network, but our dietitian actually did reach out to her dentist and he was with us uh, to provide some education for those patients who are uh, suffering from diabetes and how they should be doing their dental health. Uh, but it's not just specific to one um, group. So dental health, uh, that health is, as you mentioned, it's like one of the maybe most important because everything starts from here. Yeah. So um, if you don't take care of it, um, uh, it's it's interesting how sometimes we don't really pay attention, but we just brought someone two weeks ago, one of our sessions, uh, we have that on a Wednesday night, and it was really interesting how he was actually explaining and how actually certain diseases actually can uh, become more severe if yeah. you don't take care of um, uh, the dental issues, but I'm glad you are doing that. Yeah, it's, it, it's really uh, become a a huge passion of mine. Uh, so we passed legislation that will uh, help our federally qualified health centers uh, to, to fully staff these beautiful state-of-the-art dental clinics that they have up and down the state that are now either shuttered or operating at reduced capacity. Now they're finally able, because of a new pathway to full licensure that we adopted, they're able to now attract uh, recruit and attract dentists to, to, to Delaware and to work in these federally qualified health centers, which will dramatically expand access for patients in, in more underserved communities to be able to access dental care, 
uh, Representative Minor Brown and I are actually co-chairs of a dental care access task force that is currently meeting to um, outline future recommendations for reform in this space to build on that progress and to make sure that no matter where you live in Delaware, you're able to uh, easily and, and, uh, and uh, uh, you're able to access affordable dental care easily. Um, in addition to that, just three things I want to make sure I mention: telehealth. We've made serious reforms to telehealth. Representative Benz and I, um, uh, particularly two years ago, passed legislation that takes some of the lessons learned from COVID and, and make sure that they're implemented more permanently here in, in Delaware for telehealth. There's more to do. Um, it, the health committee also oversees social services, which includes the kids department. And we were able to pass legislation that tackles one of the most frequent issues we hear from youth in and aging out of foster care, which is a lack of access to a driver's license and auto insurance. So we've reformed policies to open up pathways to driver's license for youth aging in and aging out of foster care and to subsidize auto insurance for youth in and aging out of foster care. That was a, a bill I was really proud to, to work on with Representative Heffernan. And then finally, the last thing I want to mention um, is outside of the healthcare space, but I think something that is, is really critical for the health of our democracy and our own mental health is legislation that creates the nation's most comprehensive digital citizenship standards in our K through 12 public schools. Uh, that's educating students on everything ranging from the mental health consequences of bullying online to how to be discerning consumers of news and information online to identify facts from fiction, disinformation and, and misinformation, um, opinion from hard news to give students the tools necessary to safely and responsibly navigate the internet for themselves, for one another and for our democracy. You know what, Sarah, sure. you talked about the kids department, but you didn't talk about a big win, a big win that we had with yeah. the, the, the um, funding for the for the kids in, in the um, juvenile facility for them to now receive cognitive behavioral therapy and, and job training. Yes. You know, before they go out into the community. Back, before they, yeah, before the community. Okay. This was a bill that Representative Minor Brown introduced. I was really proud to serve as the Senate prime sponsor of that invests um, hundreds of thousands of dollars in um, reentry supports and services uh, for youth uh, exiting our um, juvenile justice system, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, and also um, professional training. Yep. Yeah, professional help. So now, because the election is a uh, little more than a week from now, um, I do want to actually um, address a couple of the issues uh, with the uh, COVID, the way that COVID changed our lives. Uh, mail-in voting uh, become like more important in this um, these times, and I think different states are doing different things. So, what's our situation in Delaware uh, in terms of uh, uh, mail-in voting? So, I'm 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 happy to uh, dive in here. Uh, we have really tried to make uh, expanding access to the ballot box, voting rights here in Delaware, a top priority. Um, Delaware has. Among the has had the, among the most restrictive voting rules in the country, certainly among states that have have um, democratic majorities, uh, and that's why over the last several years we've expanded access to the ballot box through um, early voting, which actually started today at 11 a.m. Uh, Northern Newcastle County folks can go to the shipyards shops or the Claymont Community Center for early vote. That starts today, um, but this past General Assembly. We sought to, to, to take the next step by passing same day uh, voter registration and vote by mail. Um, so initially, the Delaware General Assembly had sought to uh, pursue a holistic solution to the questions of vote by mail and absentee voting by amending our state constitution uh, to take away the fairly narrow rules around absentee voting, uh, to open it up for the General Assembly to create no excuse absentee voting and a and a pathway to vote by mail. Um, unfortunately, despite the fact that that constitutional amendment passed the previous General Assembly um, with bipartisan support with the super majorities necessary to be added to the constitution, uh, unfortunately, it was not able to secure that same support uh, this General Assembly. Uh, and I think it comes as, as um, frankly, no coincidence that the event that occurred in between those two general assemblies was the 2020 election and the ensuing big lie from Donald Trump. Uh, and so we saw, unfortunately, Republican support for these reforms 
disappear once once the big lie was was initiated. And so the Delaware General Assembly, uh, Democrats in the Delaware General Assembly decided to, to pursue a route that other states have, have pursued, which is to say, while the Constitution speaks to absentee voting, it doesn't necessarily speak to vote by mail. And these are two distinct things. So we did pass a law that would allow for vote by mail. Um, unfortunately, as you alluded to, the Delaware Supreme Court recently came in and ruled both the same day voter registration law and vote by mail unconstitutional, which means for this election, we will not have same day voter registration or vote by mail. Uh, and, and we will have to pursue a constitutional route for both, which is one of the reasons why I believe it's so important, and I hope I'm not overstepping, to elect Democrats this November because we're the only party that's going to be willing to amend the Constitution to make voting uh, easier for Delaware residents while obviously protecting the integrity of our elections. You know, in the year 2022, 2023, you would think that this should be readily available and more people should be taking advantage of, right? So uh, hopefully other people would, other states are uh, following our lead. Um, well, I know uh, Nelson needs to go. Uh, I believe you have some uh, obligations, uh, and I don't want to um, overstep to that. So I do want to have a question. You work in the BA system as a nurse for a long yeah. time. Um, now, in terms of the uh, the different systems, the state, the VA, uh, the private insurances, private settings, um, in terms of healthcare, and uh, more on the private practice side. What can we expect? What kind of support can we expect from you? Uh, because you should be really understanding the private practice setting, which is the saver for um, the industry. Because if you are going to actually go for low cost um, without um, giving up on uh, quality, the private practice is the main back, back, backbone of the uh, inexpensive care. Uh, Anything on your radar uh, for the election, other, after the election that you would be working on with the private oh, practices? Well, actually, I think it's so funny that you say that because um, I actually just had a conversation with a few folks from the Medical Society, and we plan to get together to look at how we can expand um, access to primary care um, practice in our state because we are actually losing primary care by the day. And especially the further down state you go, the worse it gets. Um, and I know I do a lot of work around maternal health, but this is literally, I'm talking primary care. It, it, it's not good at all. And I know we've moved into the hospital systems where we're providing those services in our hospitals, but there's a lot of people that still like to go to those independent practices outside of um, the, the um, hospital system. Uh, we, did do, we did do House Bill 141, which expands scope of practice for nurse practitioners to allow them to work to the full scope of their, of their um, license, which allows them to gain independent practice because we do need additional primary care providers, um, not just primary care, but we're talking psychiatric mental health nurse practitioners as well. And it's the family nurse practitioners, pediatric nurse practitioners in our community, especially out in those rural areas, but that's still not enough. So we are going to have to I mean, since uh, you mentioned that I do want to make sure that we have the good understanding of the medical society. Unfortunately, Delaware Medical Society is not just the, uh, the medical society, but they are also they provide um, services uh, at charge uh, and also also they have some um, form of uh, businesses uh, which are competing with us. As you know, there are four um, there are four um, ACO, the accountable care organizations, uh, United Medical and Allied are the two private ones. Mm -hmm. And the well, United Medical is the only homegrown one. So the other one is nationwide. So they just came later on. So we'll take that credit. But the other two are the hospital base. But the St. Francis and Medical Society has a partnership uh, on their ACO. Uh, so they it makes it um, uh, almost like a competitor for us. Um, so other than the Christiana Hospital, they have their own ACO, but Medical Society is in a partnership with uh, St. Francis. Mm -hmm. And then they provide some other services. None of my 190 uh, providers in Delaware are members of Medical Society. So uh, this is one of the things that I wanted to make sure that you were aware, aware of. When things are happening um, that needs to reach out to the medical community, we want to make sure that this is done at the ACO level because one of the reasons that we had this issue recently, we were going to talk about it, and I, I don't know if what time you need to be definitely 
uh, drop out. So you can you can always tell me. But this issue on the medical advantage, uh, uh, medical advantage um, uh, with the state of uh, state of Delaware retirees, the reason mm-hmm. things didn't work out in a certain way. I think they were relying on medical society to communicate some of the uh, things with the providers, which we didn't know. The new Medicaid program is coming in town, uh, Delaware first, I believe. Uh, we find out in the last week of September because they were actually relying uh, on medical society. We, the medical society is just treat them as another ACO uh, because uh, from the private business side, 190 of my providers, uh, they don't have membership uh, just because we are in competing businesses. Uh, and then we can follow up on that. But I think um, uh, understanding, which I'm so happy to hear that, understanding the medical um, uh, practices in private setting and how that actually makes an impact uh, in the long run for the healthcare costs, that's really needs to be understood by public um, uh, and also by you guys because you are the policymakers. So one of the reasons that we have these discussions although my office looks like a studio, but it's, this is my business office. <laughs> so it's the reason we do this is because uh, we want to make sure that we are, like, we are, we are having these conversations and you guys are also understanding uh, what's happening in the, uh, in the reality of the healthcare. Because the hospital is never the, uh, uh, the nonprofit settings, big giants. They are not going to represent the healthcare. Uh, the provider. Like, I talked to a couple of my providers this week you mentioned something about uh, provider burnout, and that's real. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm I'm their therapist, and I don't have the education for that. <laughs> so, you know, like they because you have to just listen to them uh, after office hours. They have to vent and they have to talk about it uh, because the demand is changing, and that's why I believe that we have to support them uh, as much as possible. We have some other questions. So Melissa, I, I just want to make sure that I'm respectful to your time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, before I jump off though, I know I had a, a 2.30 time limit. Before I jump off, I do want to say that I'm so happy that that came up. And I'm hoping that sometime in the very near future, maybe I can even stop by your office and see the studio. But I would love to have that conversation, maybe bring some of the providers to the table um, prior to us going back in session and Senator McBride, I'm sure she would love to be a part of that conversation as well. And l- let's talk through this. I would love for you to educate us on, on what's happening in your, in your world in the provider in the private provider world. And then let us, let us figure out how to come up with some solutions. That would be, uh, that would be really, uh, uh helpful for, um, for us, and uh, for you to kind of see that, uh, definitely. Uh, so whenever you have time, uh, we should be, uh, we should be able to schedule that. Um, so I know Sarah is going to stay with us for a little bit longer, right, Sarah? So we have hard questions for her now. All right, yeah, give her the hard questions. I'm going to send you some to ask her, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much. It was so nice meeting you, so nice chatting with you. I'm, you I know you're in great hands with my colleague, Senator McBride, and I'm looking forward to, to chatting in person. It's, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much, and thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Have a good one. Bye, Sean. All right. Bye-bye. So, um, well, she's such a nice lady. So hopefully uh, she'll be okay, right? She won't have any um, uh, issues with the election, hopefully. I believe she's unopposed. So I think she'll be a-okay um, come November 8th. Well, uh, Sarah, so uh, we, you are a little bit different than everyone else uh, that we are uh, hosting. Um, uh, your understanding of although this is your second, it's going to be your second term, but you've been in this business for a long time and you have a really good understanding of the politics. Um, and uh, personally, what I'm seeing, uh, especially this election is going to be challenging for Democrats. Uh, it may not be in Delaware, but uh, nationwide. And uh, not sure how much uh, it's going to change, but it's a, it's a very critical uh, election. And this does happen in the midterms usually, right? So we do see these shifts and then changes from the Congress in the Congress and the Senate as well. So uh, the recession is uh, now our reality. So Sean, um, uh, he always um, helps me with these events, and we sometimes when we we don't have any guests, uh, we talk about these issues. 
Uh, we, we did say recession is coming, uh, but recession already is here. And, uh, and I think this is gonna have a big impact on the election because one of the things that I'm looking at here, the key issues is, for this election is 30% uh, on the employment and wages. Um, and the, everything else is coming after that, like the public safety is at 18%. Uh, but when you look at the a couple of the other things together, like the, the listed listing is a little bit different economy is with the employment and everything is almost 40 plus. So it's one of the biggest one. How are we going to deal with that, with the recession? You, you may not have the right answer today, but uh, how is this affecting you guys? So, uh, you know, I, I think your, your, your comment is spot on in that it's every election is the economy stupid is, uh, is the Bill Clinton quote from the 90s. Um, and, and I think that that's certainly true uh, in this election. Now, as you said, the party in power always has a challenging midterm. Um, and this is this is is no different. Having said that, I will say uh, that despite the challenges, um, despite the economic challenges, you know, and and while the U.S. is technically in recession, I think what people are are feeling the most, what I certainly hear the most, isn't isn't the concept of the of of the of the technical recession, but is of course inflation and the cost of living, um, and. Despite those challenges, I will say Joe Biden's approval rating is hovering between 44 and 46 percent, which is actually better than any president in recent history at this point in their presidency, with the sole exception of George W. Bush after 9-11. Um, and so his actual his approval rating, while it's it's under 50, is better than most um, presidents at their first midterm. Um, I, I do think that um, the, the you know the reality is is that the party out of power benefits when the economy uh, is facing challenges, regardless of whether they put forward results. Uh, and I think what's clear is that the alternative in this election really just has not put forward any kind of proposals um, to counteract and and to address the the rising cost of living, whereas. The Democrats, on the other hand, um, have done a number of things uh, at the federal level. Of course, the Inflation Reduction Act, investing in 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 uh, America's energy future, uh, including renewables, um, is a critical part of addressing long term issues with inflation by making America more energy independent. Obviously, the war in Ukraine, for instance, um, impacts energy costs, um, particularly in Europe, but around the world. Uh, and the disruption of supply chains that we've seen um, in COVID and then as a result of the instability within, um, within Eastern Europe as well, impacts um, the costs of goods uh, around the world. And so the Inflation Reduction Act, by investing in um, uh, our energy future, is going to address some of the long-term structural issues that come with rising costs. It, it also included the ability of Medicare to negotiate the price of prescription drugs, um, uh, they, uh, we in Delaware, for instance, have capped the uh, out-of-pocket expenses for um, uh, diabetes equipment. Uh, the Democrats at the federal level have capped the cost of insulin. Um, there are a number of steps that, that Democrats have been taking to try to address the costs that are facing families. One that I believe that will continue to push forward here in Delaware uh, is uh, the, the, the challenge of affordable childcare. This is a major cost that families are facing. Uh, and it's one of the greatest cost burdens that families are facing right now. Uh, and it's not only impacting their wallet, but it's pushing people out of the workforce because we know that new moms who aren't able to access affordable childcare are actually 12% less likely to continue to work. That then has an impact on the worker shortage we're facing. And that then has an impact on the rising costs of goods and services. And so all of these are connected. So childcare is a critical area. And then finally, I mentioned housing. Housing is is uh, is an issue that we are increasingly hearing about, and the cost of housing, of course, is a challenge for far too many homeowners, renters, uh, and families. And so, addressing that those challenges, whether that's protecting renters uh, or 
helping to lower the cost of housing. I think that comes through smart growth policies um, that increase our housing supply. Um, one area, for instance, that I think we should be more seriously exploring is as we increasingly move to work, uh, work, uh, remote work, we're seeing a lot of commercial spaces that are now vacant. How do we take commercially zoned properties, whether we're talking about office buildings or retail stores, and help to transform those areas that are already developed, they're just developed commercially, but are no longer of use? How do we redevelop those into more housing to create more stock? Because the United States has about a 4 million uh, uh, house deficit uh, between the stock and the demand. And the demand. And that is obviously increasing costs for housing. And so we need to increase stock, but we've got to do it responsibly. And I think that's one creative way to really address that, that, that housing shortage. So, no, th those are all important. Uh, the one, one actually, you know, it's, it's a touchy subject, but I think um, I'll just say it from my side. So then I personally am concerned about uh, uh, President Biden's uh, health. Um, just because when I'm seeing certain uh, videos, and I, I'm being very careful not to watch everything, but do you have any concerns with his health? I don't. I don't. Um, you know, I with him, like you see him in person, so that's why I'm asking you this. I, no, I, I I was literally just going to say I see him in person um, relatively frequently. Uh, I actually just had a, a a a call surprisingly from him. Um, and my conversations with him, when I see him in person, when I talk, when I talk to him, um, he is uh, the Joe Biden that I've always known. Uh, he is uh, calm, cool, collected. He's uh, on top of, of, of the issues. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm confident that Joe Biden has the, um, has the health, the rigor uh, to, to continue to serve as president. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm not concerned, you know, a lot of times I, I haven't seen every video, but a lot of times the videos we see online are selectively edited. Um, you know, we are all prone to, to lose a train of thought or to, um, uh, to, 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 to stutter. Um, you know, and I think a lot of, a lot of, of this is, is rooted in, uh, perhaps some, some, of the stigma that surrounds the fact that Joe Biden had a stutter as a kid. And a lot of these videos are selectively edited. So, you know, I, I can only go to go from what I, what I see unedited and what I see in person. And, um, I was saying that I'm being very careful with not, uh, not watching everything out there. Now, yeah, so no. one of the, um, just going out of that, um, you know, the, in this event, we do cover the global, um, current events and, one of the concern uh, that I see uh, being from a different country, being here for the last 24 years. Um, now I'm also a little bit older than you are, just a couple of years. So now the, um, I feel a little bit differently with the way we are today uh, globally. So uh, like in this video that we are looking at, like um, Tigray was kind of like an opening point for me uh, in the last three years. Um, I think I mentioned this to you, Dr. Uh, Isaiah Sirigal, who's uh, one of my uh, surgeon partners in business. He's from Tigray uh, region. And uh, we, it was actually 2019 uh, fall. So it's, it's almost three years. And it was kind of like isolated, although it impacted five, six million people. Then it goes to other places, Yemen, and then you see Ukraine now. Taiwan uh, is another one. What happened in Sri Lanka is uh, concerning. Uh, Libya is a mess. So it's like, almost like if we are, are we at the edge of uh, this uh, era where we are gonna be in a big war? That feeling is like, I can't avoid that. Um, so sometimes it keeps me up, up at night. Um, and then when the recession is uh, initiated mainly from pandemic and I think this global events are not helping altogether. So uh, and I know this may not be specific to your um, uh, your focus for today in Delaware, but this is going to affect all of us right at the end of the day. Um, any anything you would like to say regarding these uh, or your uh, global um, uh, perspective is with this current stuff that's happening? 
Yeah. Well, I, I, you're absolutely right um, that it impacts all of us. And there is a, my dad used to quote a professor of his from Georgetown. It was also actually a professor of, of, of Bill Clinton's um, where he talked about sort of the, the cycles of history and that at every point society reaches an age of conflict. And the question is, can society reform to address the underlying causes of that age of conflict or does that age of conflict, conflict ultimately undo um, that, that society? And of course, in a globalized world, uh, the fall of a particular society isn't limited to, you know, one region of the, of the globe. It's, it has a, it has a global impact. Um, and we are in an age of conflict. Um, we are in an age where there is instability. Um, I think there's a, a series of, res of, of, of reasons for this. I mean, whether you, I, I think there's a, a mix of, um, frankly, the 2008 economic recession, had a, a massively destabilizing impact. Uh, I think the, of course, the um, the war in Iraq. I think also destabilized the Middle East in a pretty significant way, which then also resulted in a um, a degree of migration that uh, we see, for instance, in Europe. They are, I think, in the throes of political conflict over uh, that. All sort of stems from the uh, instability in, in in the Middle East that was in part a byproduct of the war in Iraq, there's been a whole host of, of consequences that I think have fostered and led to this age of conflict that we're in. Um, and I think what it's what it's really presenting uh, is, is not only a degree of instability with then mutual alliances that put us at risk of a global uh, phenomenon, uh, violent phenomenon, but also has really put at risk liberal democracy as a concept. Um, uh, liberal, not you know, ideologically, but liberal democracy as a concept. Uh, and we're seeing a democratic backslide, I think in large part because a lot of these underlying dynamics. Uh, we've seen democratic backslide in Eastern Europe in places like Hungary, uh, in Poland, um, certainly a democratic backslide in Russia, which looks, which frankly has a, a centralized government uh, source of power that actually exceeds the height of, of the Soviet Union. I mean, there's more power concentrated in Vladimir Putin than there ever actually was in any single leader within the Soviet Union. Um, and, and of course we've seen a democratic backslide here in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I don't have answer, an answer necessarily for how we, we, we address this. A lot of it's rooted in economics. Um, a lot of it's rooted in, in past foreign policy blunders. Um, but I also think one of the challenges is that the United States, um, our moral authority in the world has been dramatically undermined over the last several years. And I think one of the critical parts of ensuring a degree of stability is regaining uh, the moral credibility of the United States as a global leader. Um, and when we shrink into ourselves, uh, when we become isolationist, uh, when we undermine our support for democracy at home or abroad, uh, that has a ripple effect. And I think that part, what, what we're seeing right now in part is a byproduct of the United States' diminished presence in the world that I think was in large part, partly because of Iraq, but a large part because of Donald Trump. Uh, and, and Joe Biden's, I think, doing his best to try to regain that. And I will say, I think Joe Biden, I don't want to talk too long about this, but Joe Biden, I think in the context of Ukraine has demonstrated a, 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 a thoughtful and restrained strength um, that is, I think, supporting Ukraine because it is both mil uh, morally and I think uh, from a real politics standpoint, the right thing to do, uh, but not so much that he is putting us at a real significant risk of a global conflict because of it. Um, yeah, I think thus far it's a hard balance to strike, but I think he has struck that balance. And I'm not talking about the physical distance, but the way that we are uh, positioning ourselves actually is a safe distance that we have. I agree with you on that. Um, I know uh, we are taking a lot of, of a lot of your time, but not this Tuesday, but next Tuesday is the election. So um, you you won't uh, you won't have any issues. Uh, 
getting elected, obviously, but I do expect um, uh, a lot more from you after this next one, um, because there are bigger uh, seats that you are gonna probably represent in the future. That's my personal belief. Um, so, and I think that's where you can actually really help uh, with all the experience that you have. Uh, and I do wanna see you in those seats, hopefully. Um, now, what would you like to say to the voters for uh, November 8th? The last thing that you wanna say to them? Sure, well, that's very kind of you to say. Um, you know, I know politicians always come and say that this is the most important election of our lifetime. Um, but I, I truthfully believe that because of how delicate the state of our democracy is, as we were just talking about, that means that every election does become the most important election of our lifetime, because that means we become only one election away from um, the risk of election deniers getting elected secretaries of state, uh, attorneys general, uh, governors, state legislators, people who have made clear that they're willing to overturn the will of voters. Uh, and that is the beginning and the end of, of democracy. And so we become only one election away from our democracy being at grave risk. Um, and so this is the most important election of our lifetime because of it. Um, democracy is very much on the ballot. But in addition to that, what is on the ballot is whether we are going to elect a party uh, that continues to be a cult of personality or a party that for all of its faults, for all of its disagreements, um, at least is trying to put forward solutions to address the big issues of our time. At least is trying to put forward real and tangible solutions to the cost of living crisis and inflation, to expanding access to healthcare, to creating more dignity for people. Um, and I believe that's the Democratic Party. I believe that's my colleagues. And I believe that here in Delaware, we've been making important progress on those day-to-day -day quality of life issues that impact so many people, uh, red and blue. Uh, and if we're elected, we'll continue to deliver, deliver for everyone, fight for everyone, and fight to build a Delaware that is kinder with greater opportunity in every corner of our little but beautiful state. You just said it, so I think Delaware is doing it well. And um, I'm hoping that other states uh, can follow our lead and, and they can become better and uh, more successful. And Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I really do appreciate this. And I know you know this, but uh, you are always available for us. and. Um, that's important. Uh, that means a lot for us. Uh, being able to talk to you, uh, understanding the issues in a better way, uh, also being your voice in so, uh, some cases, uh, that also uh, makes it a lot more meaningful. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. Bye-bye. Sean, thank you. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, of course. All right, so, well, this was a good conversation. So I know we have our bariatric Friday in three minutes. Um, so we are gonna, uh, we are expecting a couple confirmations for next week. Um, yeah, one more Friday before the election. Yes, um, so Congresswoman is, uh, we are waiting on, and there are a couple other state officials. Um, we'll see if, um, uh, if like, we'll communicate on the Zoom, on the YouTube uh -huh. channel, so. Yeah. Uh, but this was a really good conversation and uh, thank you for being part of it and we'll be back next week and we'll be back in two weeks on bariatric friday with dr irga thanks